Second, uh, if you want to just discover and aproveita of the Brazilian culture, today we can meet at 7.30 at uh, the lobby of uh, Universe, uh, Universe Hotel and we can go to a dinner in some fancy place, then we decide and then we see. It's quite, in the, uh, it's quite the night. So have a nice continuation of the, of the conference. Now it's my turn. Okay, so we have now Emily Ishida, so our last speaker of the day. Yeah. So she will talk about the interdisciplinary for astronomical data challenges, the case for plastic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I'd like to um, thank the organizers for allowing me to give this talk because this is going to be and I think it's a good thing I was put in the last talk of the day, so this is a little bit different from all of the cosmology that we have all over the day, but uh, it's my, uh, I think, I hope this will be interesting for you as well. Uh, I will start from, from, the, back, from uh, the other way around. I will tell you about Plastic, which is an initiative that have been developed within LSST, so I think uh, this is a good motivation for this workshop. And after that, I will tell you how this connects uh, the interdisciplinarity that the, the whole picture of the data science, the, the, the big data scheme that we are entering now, is obligating us to, to, to face anyway. So I hope in the end we have a, a good discussion about it. But before I start, uh, my name is Emily. I, I am originally Brazilian. I was postdoc in Sao Paulo for a long time, so I'm very happy to be here. And now I am in Clermont-Ferrand in France. If you do not know where Clermont-Ferrand is, it's not your fault. It's okay. Um, so Clermont-Ferrand is a three of Paris. Uh, they are very, very, very proud of being most cheap nuts than other types of, in, of other regions in France. That's what they tell me anyway, I cannot say. Um, it's the birthplace of Blaise Pascal, and it's called the Massif Central. So you see these uh, reg uh, green regions around here are all a chain of volcanoes, uh, which are very famous for people who like hiking, and the region is, is very a, a lot new for people who like hiking mountains and volcanoes and things like that. Uh, but we also have, apart from all of those interesting things, we also have in Université Clermont-Auvergne uh, a very active group in Supernovae working on LSST, the SN Factory, ZTF, and also because I'm there, we have a lot of uh, cosmic statistics initiative going on, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that today. So, first things first, what is plastic? Uh, PLASTIC stands for Photometric LSST Astronomical Time Series Classification Challenge, and I did not make up the acronym, so not my fault. Um, wh what happens, what is, what is the idea of all this? So I think Dylan gave, um, you had arrived, already had today a very nice introduction about supernova, type 1A supernovae, and if you understand correctly, the uh, time of supernovae are very, very nice for cosmology, but in other spectra to tell you that that's a type 1A supernovae and the brightness of that thing you're looking at. Um, so the point is that you, what you would like to have is you would like to have spectra for all of those kinds of things and then you can see okay there's this huge sil silicon line here around 6,000 angstroms and that's, that's a type 1A supernovae and you go on with your cosmology like that. The problem is that we will have spectra for a very, very, uh, very small number of not only the supernovae, but all of the transients that LSST is going to, to discover. And we need to know what to do with all of the data, not only type 1A supernovae, but if you want to do anything with those bunch of light curves that we are going to find, you need to at least have an idea of what their classification. So the problem, you can think of the problem like this. You have this small, very biased data set for which you have spectra and photometry, and you have this huge data set for which you only have light curves, and you have to do something so you can use this very big uh, blue region here. And obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is to apply supervised machine learning. So this means that you have a training sample for which you have light curves and labels. You train <coughs> your model in this thing, and you apply to the, to the largest uh, sample use everything you can learn here and apply it to the larger sample. This is a textbook a machine learning algorithm does. And this is 
obviously this has been tried for a long time. Um, the first time that someone putting out a uh, simulated light curve was in 2009, 2010. Uh, it was the first supernova uh, photometric classification challenge. This challenge, as the name said, was only supernovae. So this was a bunch of light curves simulated for the dark energy survey. And there was only 1As, 1BCs, and type 2, so only supernovae. There was no question about what kind of transit you're looking at. And you had 1,100 objects for training and 20,000 objects for, for targeting. Uh, this was a very like uh, manual de uh, data challenge, which means that uh, Rick made a simulation. They put it somewhere in a website, and people were invited to contribute to models. Uh, this was 10 groups participated, submitting 13 entries, and the end result was that there was obviously they had a metric, you know, how, how to calculate which model was. Uh, uh, S S SNID got the better overall but if you look at all of these submissions, so this is the, the score, let's say, and this is redshift, and what you want is uh, all of this to be one, and what you have to see from this plot is these dotted lines, which is training on, on the training and estimating on the target. Um, so this, this group uh, led by Masao Sako, they, they, they got the overall better result, but none of the models were obviously better than all the others. So they are uh, one or uh, numerically better, but there was nothing that said this is obviously the way to go. So, but the, the good thing about this challenge was that the data set that was released with this challenge is, is used until today for people who want to try different algorithms and different classification schemes, okay? What is, so we came to the idea of, of some time ago of doing a second version of the challenge in the context of LSST. Because now things are going to get much, much, uh, if the first challenge gave a few ideas but didn't answer all your questions, now the problem is much bigger. So uh, you have already seen this today. So to tell, our uh, data set now is around like 1,000 samples. We hope that by 2025, this comes to more than 10,000. Uh, 10,000 supernovae only, and, but in order to find that, LSST will have 2 million alerts a night, which means that you'll have 2 million things that might be some transient in your data stream. You have to, you have to, uh, to uh, deal with that. So just to have an idea, 40 nights of this, of this transient data stream from LSST is uh, equivalent to the entire Google database 2013. I don't know how, how much that is now. Uh, but this is the kind of problem we had, we had to do. So we said, okay, we are in another age now. Data challenges now are something that are much more common. There we have a whole infrastructure to do that. So that, let's do something, uh, something, something very designed for LSST. So this was more or less the preparation timeline. So remember that now, for LSST, the challenge is not only supernova anymore, it's transient, right? So there is galactic, there is extragalactic, there is a variable star, eclipse, there are, I cannot say much more, but there are many other types of models, uh, not only type 1A supernovae, but we want people to train uh, in a very small training set and try to classify the rest. So uh, in December 2016, we made an application for an LSST enabling, enabling science grant so we could fund this. Uh, it, the request was approved by early 2017. And in May, we had a, a call for model contributions. I would like to show you this time so you can have an idea of how big a community was involved in this exercise. For each model that we want to include in the challenge, there's, there is a group of, of people working on modeling specific transients, and these people had to provide us templates, light curves, in order to be inputted in SNN so we can produce observed light curves. So if you see, this is the, first, the, the largest gap in this timeline. It took almost a year to get all the models together and make the simulation consistent. Uh, so in February 2018, we had a meeting, at, a meeting at Slack in order to understand how we could deploy this challenge. We know there's Kaggle, which is some, some of you might know. It's a, a very famous uh, comp, uh, way to handle uh, data science competitions. But we also try RAMS and a, a, few, other, a few other options. Um, in May uh, 2018, the first version of the data set was, was sent to Kaggle uh, for, because they can, Kaggle, is a company that 
they make money by doing data challenges. So they have five competitions a year that they call pro bono. So if you are a science institution or if you have a social aspect of your research and you need to use a data challenge for that, uh, you can apply for a research competition, and we did that. Uh, it took us one or two months in order to get some reply. Uh, the LSST Enabled Science Grant was handled by the University of Toronto because Rene, the PI, is from there. So we have the contracts uh, already set by July, and this was a huge problem because we have uh, LSSTs from the United States, the money was American, but the PI was in Canada, and uh, someone from all around the world should be able to contribute and get money, so this was very complicated to handle. And then in August, um, we set up a release date. So Plastic was, was launched in 28 September. Uh, and it counts with 3.5, uh, 3,500 uh, objects, each one of them in the six bands of LSST. Uh, and 14 classes in the training set. And 3 million objects in the target set. So you have to train in 3,000 and you have to estimate 3 million objects. And the point is that we have some modelers who contributed to models that were not observed yet. They were predicted, but they were not observed yet. So in the, in the target sample, we have one extra class. So the answer that we asked people to answer is, what is the probability of this specific object being each one of these classes or none of the above? Basically, that, that's the question that we, are do, we asked them. Uh, we, in the end, Kaggle uh, decided to sponsor the competition, so we had some money involved. Uh, so the, the, the main cash prizes were uh, sponsored by, by Kaggle themselves. We have an extra uh, science prize, which we hope to give to algorithms that even though they did not score like best of all of them in the leaderboard, they do have some innovation in the sense of the algorithm itself in comparison to the normal textbook machine learning. Uh, and this is funded by the LSST Enabling Science Grant. And for the group working in the development of plastic, for us as a strategy, a huge task here was to translate the problem. Okay, two huge tasks. First, to generate the simulation, and once the simulation and the data set is done, how do I take this horribly difficult problem that we know all the caveats about and transfer that to a language that non-astronomers can understand and can work on this. So for us, this was a huge, a huge task to do because uh, with the challenge, we released uh, Astronomer Starting Kit. So this notebook will explain to you what is a pass band, what is flux, what is a redshift, how this is used in cosmology and things like that. Uh, we also release a classification demo. So this is a notebook that tells you very, very, uh, uh, that tells us to use all the knowledge that you acquire in the previous link and use this in a very dumb classifier so you can learn how to read the data, how to prepare the data, how to feature extract and things like that. Um, with the, the cargo, with the challenge, we also release um, uh, a note in the archive. So this is not supposed to be a paper. This is basically the notebook in archive version. So maybe some astronomers will, will find this first, then, then, then find the, the note. Uh, and we also release a matrix paper. So the metric that we are using in the challenge is a weighted log loss function. But there was a whole group inside LSST that was, um, that was working on understanding what would be the best metric for this, type of co for this type of competition. These people did not see the model themselves. They worked with mock data. So we gave them mock classification tables and mock confusion matrices in order to understand in, in the various cases which, were, which would be the best metric that we would, we would find for this. Um, so... So today, tonight, unfortunately, I cannot ask you to join because tonight is the deadline for <laughs> the, the challenge ends today. But up to yesterday, uh, up to now, uh, this effort got 1,382 people involved, which means we have 1,300 uh, uh, 1,300 people, almost 400 people, working on the the classification of light curves for LSST, which is much much more than we. For what we talk with Kaggle, they said, yeah, this is kind of difficult. They're not images because deep learning people like to work with images and things like that. We only gave the numbers. Maybe 300, 
400 if we are very, very, very nice. And I told them that they're underestimating how inspiring astronomy really is for people, and you'll see that, I, that I'm right. So uh, we had uh, more than 1,000 teams because each one of these people can join efforts with another a team in order to uh, in order to get and all of these people submitted 20,000 times which means that you have your classifier you generate an answer table a table with the probabilities of the classes you upload to the leaderboard and you see use that answer to improve your classifier and you upload again so you are going to you are going to try to see how you're going like that um, and one thing of the things you see, there's a lot of things here if you are interested on this. I'd just like to take a few moments to, to go through the discussion board, which I think is very interesting. Uh, so you see most of these people are non-astronomers. So for us, it was very, very nice to see they bit by bit learning the things that we hope they know. So for example, at the very beginning someone said, you are thinking that this is a, a machine, a supervised machine learning problem, but you see this is actually an anom anomaly detection because we have that extra class that we want you to classify as none of the above, and that's very important. So you you have a high score in the leader. Um, there is also some interesting. So some they they definitely do not like MJDs. They don't like that, uh, which, which is the way that we give dates and, and time. And someone said, OK, let's use the standard dates and times. But it's also interesting that very quickly they realized that was not a very good idea to do. Uh, and also, in the, in the very beginning, they, have, uh, they, they, they were discussing between themselves what are the hard classes, what are the, the easy classes. And uh, those things were very interesting for us to see as, 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 as organizers. Uh, and another interesting thing is that we want to be able to do this because one thing that we also, before, beyond the all data, data thing, one thing that is really, really important to know is, is domain knowledge important or not? So we, would, we do not want to prevent astronomers to participate on the challenge. So if you are not a member of the, of the, of the group that participating in the validation or in the simulation of the data, you are allowed to compete. It doesn't matter if you are an astronomer or not. And this was nice because a few astronomers tried. I don't know how many astronomers tried, but the ones that I, I know a few that tried. And they provide very interesting discussions in the, in the discussion board because they provided knowledge that um, other comp com competitors would, would not have and that helps to level the playing field a little. So Kyle, for example, Kyle is uh, an ex who is now in a data science job in the Silicon Valley, and he provides very interesting GitHubs for people to uh, work on. And Johannes also is a customer working in Chile right now, and he provides a complete data, a complete GitHub with visualization, transformation, training methods. And he said, "I spent a lot of times on these already. I got to this core. If you can use this." be my guest, and that's, that was a very nice thing to do as well. And they continue to participate in the discussion boards uh, afterwards as well. Um, there is other, other type of astronomer. So Manu is my boss, so I think I can tell about that. Uh, he is very, very interested in the feature extraction part. So scientifically, he doesn't have classification, but he's very, very interested on how different objects will play, can be treated differently in order to improve the feature extraction. So he developed a kernel and submitted and said to people, you know, I think this is a very good fit for class six. Then like 17 people started talking to him about how better extract features in, in class six. So it was a very interesting conversation to look at. Um, this is a typical evolution of a non-astronomer working on the, on the data. Uh, so this is the score, so it's log loss, so perfect to zero, right? You want to get to zero. And this is the date. So you see that this is one of the competitors. Uh, they start, uh, there is a, normally a very big jump somewhere. And if you look at the discussion board, you see that up to here, they were not using the light curves at all. They were only using metadata. Because we provide data of host galaxy redshift, environments, and blah, blah, blah. And at first, they only start working with that. So when they said, OK, I cannot improve in here anymore, then they start using the actual curves. And then you see this hairy big bump in the, in the score. And you can see that in practical all of them. And this is, a, uh, this is Kyle. Uh, uh, what is the difference here is that he didn't bother to 
At least I think that's what happened. I didn't talk to him. But it seems that he doesn't have that huge gap. I guess he was working with the light curves from the start. This is, this is my guess on this. Tomorrow I can ask him what he did. Um, so this is the, just so you can see more or less the whole, uh, the whole evolution uh, of the leaderboard. And if we have a zoom in the last few days, just so you can have an idea, so this is uh, 5 of October, and the order here are different competitors, and the order is always the same, okay? So you see the leaderboard in 5 of October, one week later, there is some, some, some people that didn't even show up, up to three weeks in the challenge, and then you start seeing how they evolve, and you can see how things are going to sometimes here, from here to there, I just made a zoom in the, in the visualization because it was getting too, too high. So you see that things start to homogenize after a while, and this was yesterday. Uh, so this was me trying to provide you a very nice visualization of the leaderboard, which is completely useless because you, this was yesterday. If you go there now, everything is changed, and the people who is in the second and third place, uh, well, so yeah, I, I, I tried, I'm sorry. Um, so you see uh, the leaderboard is like that now. And the very interesting thing is Kyle is still win winning. Uh, the other people are not astronomers. All of the others that are very close to him, they are not astronomers. But there's probably some, I guess there's probably, some, I cannot say if it's the main knowledge or not, but I, I would like to believe that it is, the, the difference that, that he has. Uh, so what are the next steps on this? So. As I said, uh, the, the margin and registration is already over. The deadline is today. Uh, but up to the 15th of January, we have the science prizes, who do not give money, do not get uh, money from that. But you, you will be invited to uh, one of the LSST conferences in order to present your solution if you get one of the science prizes. And that was done to give visibility to algorithms that maybe are not very nice in the leaderboard, but can still be interesting for science. Um, and the announcement would be 15th of January. There's going to be a whole session in the WAS meeting uh, in January presenting the results, the classification, and everything like that. And we, we have more challenges scheduled. At this point, the, the plastic team is a little bit exhausted, so I'm not sure when that's going to happen, but I'm sure that after a few months, after everything is calm, we'll start working on that again especially because Kaggle does not allow very different questions. So Kaggle only allows you supervise machine learning questions. So you have a training, you have a test, you classify, and that's it. And we have a lot of questions like unsupervised learning and other things that we want to ask, but inside the Kaggle framework, that cannot be done. So we have to figure out how, how that's going to work. Uh, and one thing that I would like to say is that if you are, if you are any interested in this, and you didn't have time, or you just know about this now, uh, even after the challenge is done, you are allowed to submit answer tables. So you can submit answer tables. You will get a score, but this score will not be reflected in the leaderboard. Right? The leaderboard is frozen by the time the challenge is done. But you can still use the whole machinery in Kaggle to see how you are doing and, and how you're, you are in. So I have to talk about the team. Uh, this was a huge effort of people. Uh, Rene from Canada is uh, the PI. Rick Cluster did the simulations. Galton was in charge of documentation and the validation team, which also include Kara and me. Uh, uh, she has huge time devoted to this. And I was in charge of logistics, which means I had to talk to Kaggle, basically. Uh, and also, an another team I have to acknowledge is the modelers, because the modelers are the people who are, are working with us for the longest, like two years already that they are involved in this. And by this time, they are anonymous, because if I give you their names, you can Google them and discover in which object they are the most specialist on. So we are working on a simulation paper. And in this paper, all the models are going to be explained, and the modelers will be as they should, but up to this point they are anonymous, but they, they did put a lot of effort on this. This is part of my talk, so I still have a few minutes left, and I just wanted us to stop for a little bit and understand what's going on here. Why, why a th more than 1,300 people are interested in this kind of thing? Okay, and uh, just so you can 
can have an idea of how, how this is important. This is one of the discussion topics that was posted one week ago. The guy said, this competition is not something you see every day in Kaggle. The data is clean. I don't know what he means by that, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's a good thing. Um, the features are simple and mysterious. Uh, the spread on the leaderboard is amazing. What he means is that in many Kaggle competitions, the people who are on top, they, they differ from each other like in the three or four decimal place, which means it's basically numerically. Like the, the leaders are not doing anything much different from each other. But in our case, they are really apart from, uh, from, uh, uh, from a few points. So it's doing something different. Um, it is clear that the top guys are doing something special. There are just so many things to try, so much potential. Not to mention, we are predicting the stars. How cool is that? And that's why I was trying to tell from the beginning that this is very inspiring. And the other thing uh, this guy said was, uh, so you see, there is some balls in the bottom of these people. This means that they are Kaggle grandmaster, competitions grandmasters, which means these are people that take Kaggle competitions all the time, and they have a, high, a very high score in all of the Kaggle competitions they have. And when we talk with uh, the Kaggle people in order to evaluate what they think, how this was going, they said that they were not so much impressed with the 1,400 people, but they were really impressed with the number of grandmasters that were participating, even if we are not giving that much money. Because we are in the lowest possible money that you can have, and these people normally they just go for, for $100,000 or things like that. Um, and he said, I'm sure I learn a lot when all, all, everything is disclosed. What, they have, uh, what makes this competition special, it's an open classification. I've never worked on an open classification before, and this is fascinating. Open classification is the plus one class that is in the target sample, and it's not in the training. And I was very, very happy with this because the Let's do it. Because that's what means that the problem is not a normal supervised machine learning anymore. That it was very nice for us to see it. What I would like you to think about is that I think it's, it's nice to hear these people. It's not nice, but it's expected that you see this kind of, these people saying this kind of argument if you were looking to things like this. I understand that this is inspiring, and I agree with that. But they are, they are talking about this, looking at that. That's not very inspiring, okay? That's what they're looking at. This is, this is, how, this is how the data, the, the data is like. And um, one thing that I, I have been doing interdisciplinary science a lot, and I have been going to a few computer science conferences, and what this means in my point of view is that our data in astronomy is extremely complex, much more complex than the data people have. But this is an opportunity, because if you think of computer science or artificial intelligence things, it's amazing that uh, uh, a computer can play Go or chess. Yes, it is. But it's, let's be honest, that's a very, very self-contained, pretty well-defined environment, right? You know it's difficult, it's complex, but you know all the rules. There is nothing, there is no error bars. And you have all the rules set pretty fine. So when you talk to these people, they are very, very interesting to see that are not so is also not so straightforward defined. This is very, very interesting to see. Uh, but, but this is also not the kind of thing we normally do when we do research, right? This is not the simplifying your problem to the, to the simplest possible level so a non-expert can understand is not something we do normally in the university when you're trying to advance science. And my final point for you is that we need to adapt. And if you know me, you know where I'm going from this. And you know that if I have a talk, I have to talk about that. OK? Uh, so wh what I say when we mean to adapt is that it's not, if, it's not enough to think that we can do science as we have been doing, when now we have to compete with startups with people giving much more money to our young people, and I think that is great that people is getting more money, okay? I, I'm not making a point of this. But we, as scientific institutions, as academic institutions, we need to think about where we go from here. Let's be honest, we are in a model that has been defined almost in the Middle Ages, and that model has to change. 
and we do not need to, uh, to break the university for that, but I do believe that our culture of making science needs to change. And the Cosmos Statistics Initiative is our first try to do that. It's our small scale try to do that. And I am extremely proud to say that this is a Brazilian approach to, innovative inter to innovation in interdisciplinary science development. COIN is a group of people who wants to collaborate on astronomical data. Period. It's the only definition, right? And it's not project driven, which means that if you come to us, if you are a part of COIN, you don't know in what project you want you are going to work, and you should be fine with that. You have to be willing to collaborate to that level. The group, each year we have a meeting, and the group itself defines which project we are going to work on. We vote in the project. And what we what we discovered was that with very, very tighted environment and with a very free and creative environment, you can be very, very productive, but you as a manager do not have to decide what these people are going to do. Because this type of personality will not work well if, they tell, if you tell them what to do. And if you want to talk more about this, there is a post outside, and we are very happy to talk to you about it. So Coin is led by Rafael. Say hi. Uh, and me and Alberto. And I say it's a Brazilian approach because if you go to one of the coin meetings and if you are, if you are interested in one of the coin meetings, you can talk with Mariana and Sandro, say hi. And me, me, Michelle, say hi. Yes, they have already been working with us. So you can have a non-us opinion of uh, how, how that is go. And if you are, you are in one of the coin meetings in the first two days, you will completely understand why I say this is a Brazilian approach. It's pretty much, it seems chaotic. But it's in fact, we do not deny our, we do not deny the tupiniquing aspect of our research, okay? We embrace that, we make things work uh, in that very unstructured environment. Uh, I, my, my time, I have to finish now, but in this point, I just have to give you a few, uh, I'm finishing, I just have to give you a few examples of what happened inside the Cosmos Statistics Initiative much before plastic or anything like that. So remember that I told you this before. You have a training sample, and you have a target sample, and you have to learn everything you want from this, and you have to apply that. And when talking around, uh, normally around uh, a pool at 3 a.m. in the morning with coin people, uh, some computer science ask us, why do you think this should work, right? Because uh, a, a training in, mach in textbook machine learning, you can only, this only implies if you have a representative training set between the target and the training. And that's never the case in astronomy, right? So remember, the, the question that they posed is that maybe, only maybe, if you are not the one doing the classification, you should not be the one defining what the training set should be. You should let the machine do that. Uh, and obviously, remember, this is, a, this, this is a coin project, so this question, this point was posed, and I had to wait three years until I could convince the group of that year that they would work in this project. So three years after, I, find, I proposed this for three years in a row, and uh, three, after three years, I finally got the group to vote in my project, and you can, you can take a look on that. And the point is that if you, if you let the machine itself choose what the training set would be, you can have, uh, you can start from zero, you don't need an initial training set, and you can improve a lot. So this is, uh, you want this to be higher, and this is the number of points in your training set. You can be much, much higher than the canonical strategy, which is this one, or even if you just random sampling from, from the target sample. Like, just random sampling would, would already be much better than what you're doing now, but if you let the machine itself decide, things get much, much, much better. And this now is, is, is going to be, this now is included in the uh, desk broker initiative. So we are, uh, I'm working with uh, of people in LSST is to have a broker devoted to, uh, to desk and not a, com a community broker. So we can put this inside the, the stream of the data uh, night by night of LSST. So, my take home message, and we are very happy to talk to you guys about anything you want on this. Uh, there's just two things that I want you to take from my, my talk today, is that the future will be collaborative. And that does not only mean astronomers and non-astronomers, this means academic people with industry people, this means um, 
you talking to people who do social science development to understand what is the better environment for you to work on. And this means that you're translating your problem to other people in order so they can, uh, uh, you yourself can understand better your problem and the collaboration can really help. Uh, and the second thing is that astronomical problems are much more complex than the usual big data scenarios that machine learning people are normally used to work on. And this is not a problem, this is a huge opportunity. So if you just talk to your computer science friend with very, very much patience, you see that this is, this is a huge opportunity. And beyond that, see what happened with, with plastic. Kyle is an ex-astronomer. Uh, so he has not only the domain knowledge, but he, he, always, he also has the, the data science knowledge. And we have an army of ex-astronomers working in different environments. And this knowledge can be uh, gathered to work in academia, not full time, obviously. But we can uh, get this knowledge that they have in order to help us in the research there, that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very interesting public. So the three people who get the money, yes, you, we will be able to even have a conversation with them, like an interview and things like that. And they have to provide the code and documentation. For the other people, this is not an obligation, but this is encouraged. So the only thing that we know, if you want to apply for the science prizes, then you need to submit the model and the code. So we hope that people will submit uh, we'll make codes public, but I am not very optimistic that this is, we will be able to use that because I'm not sure how documentation can be. Our experience up to this point is that sometimes, even if the results are, are nice with the kernels that we already have online, it's not quite easy to understand the rationale beyond that. So at least the three first we will, we will get. But that's why also we want to go to other platforms that a more collaborative environment from the start. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, for the, these top three people, is there like a license restriction on how they release the code? Uh, there is. I don't remember which license is it, but it's a pretty open one. Because we want, for these three people, we want to use the codes for LSST if possible. Yeah, but I don't remember exactly which license it is, but there is a specific license involved. No, just that I've heard of problems, for example, of people <coughs> trying to integrate libraries into AstroPy, for example, but then AstroPy has, a, has an MIT license, and for example, this has happened with Helpix, it's GPL, and there's, there was a huge argument. Yeah. They just ended up having to rewrite Helpix, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basic, that's, why, that's why we are basically more interested in the algorithm perspective of, of this than in, 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 the, in the models itself, especially because the whole pipeline on, of LSST is very specific. So find some nice, uh, nice way to go from there. Probably we will have to code it up ourselves. So our interest in this is much more algorithm than in the code itself. I would like to know uh, what do you mean by a bit more about what do you mean by the active training that this is oh, sorry? I, the active training ah the, active uh, learning yeah. Oh, yeah 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 so let me I do not okay so I'm not sure I have that that slide here but uh, okay so normally what you do what, what normally what you do is you have normally what you do is you have uh, you have your data here, right? You do something, you have a machine learning model here, and then you apply this machine, you train your model, you apply this to a target sample, and then you get a classification. Right? Normally, normally this is what you do. The point is that these, in this environment, these training, this tra training data, this training data is fixed. So you have a training data from the start, you train your model, and then you do this, and you get the classification. The active learning, uh, in the way, is like you don't. You can start from zero. So suppo suppose that you do not have any training. So you begin with a random classifier, right? Um, and then you you train your model, but which means you do nothing. You have like two points. Doesn't mean anything. And then you will have some kind of classification. So for example, for each object you have an X percent probability of being, of being on a specific class. 
So in the case that we did, we only have two classes, one A's and non one A's, right? So you will choose from this target sample the guy that is closest to 50%, which means the one with the uncertainty is higher, right? So I take this guy, and then I take a spectra of that guy only, one. So I take one spectra here, and then I add this guy to my training sample, and then I train my model here, and then I do this again. So you see, I begin with nothing, and then the algorithm itself, it tells me in which objects it, he is most uncertain. So this is the guy that I don't know anything about, and I think if you give me information on that guy, I will be, be able to give you a better classification. So if you do that, it's active because the training data, the training set is not defined. The algorithm itself, it's asking you, give me this training, give me this object for training. Shouldn't you use the, the data that you are more, that you are sure about uh, what it is? To you, you can do that, you yeah. can do that. Uh, so the point is that the data that we have right now, the, we train in the spectroscopic sample and you apply in the target sample, right? The, the, the spectroscopic sample was not built thinking to be a machine learning training sample, right? The people who got those spectra, they were interested in other things. They were interested in, I don't know, specific supernova things or things like that. So this data is hugely biased towards very bright objects because it's easier to get a spectra, things that look like 1A because they say, ah, if this is a 1A, I can put this in the Hubble diagram. But from a machine learning perspective, if you look at three points in the light curve and you know it's a 1A, I don't need a spectra, right? So I, I need a spectra from the other things. So this is a way to take out the human bias in constructing your training sample. In the paper, we had some exercises that we showed that the current sample is so biased that if you start with that, you spend more time trying to de-bias your training sample than you would if you start from zero. Okay, great. More questions? Are you thinking also for a post-process of the data, like once you got your, um, you select your, your source, basically, mm -hmm. if you think you were thinking already to, like, you know, uh, Monte Carlo, like to infer, to infer uh, cosmological parameters. Yes, this is after after we have after you know which class that is. Oh, right. surely, yes, yeah. surely. Once mm -hmm. the post process of the data. Yes, yes. Everything already on that. Uh, yeah. So the point where we are right now is that we are trying to integrate this to the LSST pipeline, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously the metric of that would be how good you are in the cosmology that you get in the end. But this is my view because I'm a supernova person. Okay. If, you lo if you ask for someone to transcend some variable stars, for example, they will be interested in something else. Okay. So that's, that's the issue that you have because you have a very limited resource for spectroscopic follow-up and you have to prove that, okay, for supernova, if you let me choose the spectra, then this is how it's going to improve your cosmology, but the other observables will also have different opinions on how they want to do that. So okay. the, now we are still in the process of trying to convince people who make decisions uh, which way to go. But also like using train sets for, for evaluating your likelihood, I mean. Uh... Yeah, that, that can be done, and that can be done more in the, in the sense of what was said uh, this morning, that you can uh, actually, you give, you have a model where you take into account how confident you are exactly. that that object is a 1A or not. Yes, but that is, uh, everything is after this okay. thing. Yeah, Perfect. you're right. Other questions? If not, we thank you. Thank you. We have a wrap up. Oh, sure. yeah, sorry. <laughs> so we don't know what the wrap-up session is, but <laughs> I guess the idea is that people that talked uh, today, so we had a, a talk by Marco, Ogando, Felipe, Stephen Brown, Nick, and uh, Emily, and people should just feel free to ask more questions and uh, start some real discussions. Ah, <laughs> I hope. Yes.